Hey folks, this week in Mission History, we're talking about the birth of Anskar, also known as Apostle to the North. His birthday is celebrated this week, though scholars do debate his exact date of birth. He lived from 801 to 865. He was instrumental in the Christianization of Scandinavia. How did the epicenter for Vikings eventually become the location that would send the first Protestant missionaries to India? Stay tuned. Hey folks, J.D. Payne here. Thanks so much for checking out another one of my videos here at the YouTube channel. As always, I certainly appreciate that. So, Anskar, I know that that is a name that you don't hear very often, and it wasn't a name that I was uh, familiar with when really the origins of this video started formulating in my, my crazy brain. Uh, to give you a little bit of backstory, and I know this is going to sound kind of crazy. It all really starts at uh, Epcot in Disney World in Orlando, Florida. Uh, several years ago, my family uh, visited Epcot, and uh, while we were there, there was a ride in the Norway Pavilion. It, um, it was called uh, Maelstrom. It's no longer uh, around. Uh, sad to say, I loved it. It was a great ride. I think they have transformed it into something with like the Little Mermaid or something like that. Uh, basically, it was a log ride. In fact, there's actually a YouTube video. Someone did a point of view video uh, of the whole uh, of the entire five minute ride. You should check it out. It's called Maelstrom. Actually, there's even a Wikipedia page about this ride. But my family and I, we, we rode this ride a couple of times when we were at Epcot. And the boat ride, you get in this boat, you get it, go through this channel in the water, and it's in the dark most of the time. And it basically is a ride that takes visitors back to the time of Scandinavia's Viking days. Now, while I was on this ride um, and reflecting on, I know this is going to sound terrible, but reflecting on the violent history of the Vikings, uh, I began to recall that in 1706, the Danish Holly Mission sent Germans uh, to India. Uh, they, uh, the German missionaries they sent out was uh, Bartholomeus Ziegenbog and uh, Heinrich Kluschow. Uh, they went to a place called Tranquilbar, and they actually marked what has been called the first organized missionary undertaking in the history of the Protestant Church. So that's in the beginning of the 18th century. So it was this danish holly partnership uh, that would have incredible influence on Protestant missions for many years to follow. Now, I, I know, I, I think I know what, what's running through your mind at this point in time. And it's like, J.D., you were there at Epcot with your family riding a ride. Uh, such is not supposed to be uh, the thought of one who visits the happiest place on earth. Uh, I mean, can't you just uh, enjoy the ride? Um, true, granted, good point. But, but the, the wheels of the missiological mind were turning on this ride that was basically a, a, a reflection back on uh, Norway's history. And, and here's, what, here's what came to my mind. I started asking the question, how did Scandinavia go from basically being the epicenter of the Vikings to uh, a missionary partnership established between the Danish King Frederick, excuse me, the Danish King Frederick IV and the University of Halle in Germany. And it was that question that introduced me to this guy by the name of Ansgar, this missionary uh, pioneer, uh, missionary bishop, uh, who lived 900 years prior to the Danish Holly Mission. And so, where does this video begin? Uh, it begins uh, on a ride that no longer exists in Epcot at Disney World. So in order to talk about Ansgar and to get an idea of what was taking place related to the Christianization of Scandinavia, we, we need to have a little bit of a point of reference dealing with the issue of culture and context in Scandinavia at this time in, in Ansgar's life. 
Um, Anders uh, Wittroth, in his book, The Conversion of Scandinavia, it's a, it's a fascinating uh, work, he describes the Christianization process as occurring really in three main phases. Uh, the first phase that he talks about is where Ansgar fits in. It's the missionary pioneer phrase, uh, phase of the Christianization of the Scandinavian countries. Uh, the missionary pioneers, these were the ones that came first. The, the second uh, phase in the Christianization of Scandinavia was what he refers to as the conversion of kings. So between the years 960 and 1020, there were several Scandinavian kings that actually converted to Christianity, and their uh, authority was influential in bringing about the, this, this transition, this change. The third phase that he deals with in this book is what he refers to as the establishment of church infrastructure. Uh, it was this time in Scandinavian history uh, whereby the building of church organization, church structures throughout the countries was a significant process as a part of the Christianization of Scandinavia. Now, to understand Anskar and his work, we, we need to get a glimpse at some of the things that were happening in the 8th and 9th centuries there in that part of Northern Europe. The first Viking raid that made a significant impact in the European psyche was actually around the year 793. This was when uh, significant looting and murders and destruction occurred of a monastery uh, on the island of Lindisfarne. Uh, this was uh, in the land of Northumbria, basically northern part of England. And then what you see after that period of time is that repeated attacks from Vikings would continue to follow and uh, they would basically go in and, and pillage uh, areas. They would steal. They uh, were obviously very uh, violent in their bloodshed to obtain people's possessions. They ended up kidnapping large numbers of women. Uh, many believe that those women were probably sold as slaves. By the 830s, larger numbers of Vikings began raiding more and more locations throughout Europe, not only along the coasts, but also they, they moved inland as well. The first missionary to travel into Scandinavia during this time was Archbishop Ebo of Reims, uh, basically in France, or from France. Um, Ebo traveled to Denmark in 823. Emperor Louis the Pious assigned the Scandinav excuse me, uh, Emperor Louis the Pious actually appointed uh, Ebo to the Scandinavian peoples uh, for his missionary work. Now, uh, there is not a great deal uh, that we know about Ebo or about his work in Scandinavia. Uh, the extant historical records that we find, and those are not very many uh, at all, they turn significantly toward this guy named Anskar. The majority of what we know about Anskar comes from the writings of Rembert, his protege, excuse me, I can't even pronounce the word, his protege, uh, his successor, and, uh, and also his biographer. He, uh, Rembert, wrote a book called The Life of Anskar, uh, which has been categorized as a hagiography. Uh, though I think there's uh, great value in this piece of literature. Uh, you can actually find um, uh, the book online. It's, it's for free. In fact, I'll, I'll link it below uh, in the comment section and so, uh, or in the description section of this video. So, so check it out. I encourage you to read it. It's a fascinating read. Um, Anskar uh, was probably born in the year 801 near Corby, which is in the area of what we would refer to as France, and he died in 865 in Bremen, so Germany. Um, he was trained in the monastic tradition as a very young man. He, he ministered uh, in areas of the Frankish Empire, uh, Sweden, and in Denmark. In 826, Danish King Harald Klack was in need of assistance due to a loss of power in his country. And so he comes to Louis the Pious, who was actually the, the son, or one of the sons, of the deceased uh, Emperor Charlemagne. And so Harald said that he was ready to be baptized if Louis could enter into a partnership with him. And basically the Emperor agreed. Um, to become Harold's godfather uh, at his baptism. And so Harold, uh, his family, and about 400 followers were baptized. Harold told Louis that 
he desired to Christianize Denmark and he needed his assistance. So Louis suggested sending missionaries into uh, his land. Uh, Anskar was chosen in 826 and the first two years that Anskar spent in Denmark actually brought very few results but he established a school to train youth who would minister to their own people. Now political problems forced Anskar to leave the country in 829 uh, to be followed by his work in Sweden. Now, in Sweden, King Bjorn also wanted uh, Christian teachers to come into his context, and so he actually welcomed Anskar and his ministry uh, in Sweden. So we fast forward to 831. Louis the Pious makes Anskar Bishop of Hamburg with the desire that Hamburg would serve as a base camp for missionary labors that would go up into Scandinavia. In Hamburg, Anskar founded places of education, he founded a monastery, uh, he constructed a church facility. In 831, Pope Gregory IV made Anskar a legate to oversee the Scandinavian and the Slavic peoples. So basically, he basically becomes a missionary uh, to these peoples and, and the Pope assigns him this uh, territory. King Horat I he basically united Denmark and he welcomed Anskar's work in the country. However, in 840, Louis the Pious died. And in 845, so five years later, Vikings begin to come in and do more raiding and more pillaging and they actually destroy Hamburg. Uh, Anskar barely escapes uh, with his life, nothing much more than just the clothes on his back. And the Swedish work that had started a few years prior actually was terminated by a church bishop. And so following this time, Sweden and Denmark uh, return really to their former religious ways and denying Christianity. So in 847, some scholars have said it's 848. Uh, I even saw one scholar mentioned 849. But around this time period, Louis the German, all right, so I know we've got another name here. So Louis the German, who's actually w one of the sons of the deceased Louis the, the Pious. So when Louis the Pious dies, one of his sons, Louis the German, actually makes Anskar Bishop of Brahmin, which became the new base camp. So Hamburg sacked by the Vikings, uh, Brahmin becomes the new base camp for missions up into Scandinavia. Uh, work was continued in Sweden in 851, and Danish king Horik I gave Anskar permission uh, to return and minister in Denmark. A church building was constructed at Hedeby, and pastoral leadership was provided. However, another death comes. So King Horik dies, and who replaces him? Horik II. So Horik II actually allows the construction of another church property in the city of Reeb. So now we have um, church structures, church properties beginning to, to spread into other parts of the country. Now, Anskar died, according to scholars, on February the 3rd, 865. He was 64 years old. Over half of his life had been given to missionary work in Denmark and Sweden and also service in his own diocese. The Christianization of Scandinavia consisted uh, significantly of political transformation. Now, while I am certain there were people who came to faith in Christ, the initial work in the Northern European uh, context was really an amalgamation of Christianization and civilization and the clashing of cultures. At times, it is difficult to discern how much of what occurred was a contextualized biblical evangelization or a thoroughly syncretistic blend of European Christianity with Scandinavian traditions. Uh, I do have many theological and missiological concerns with what occurred. Uh, however, I think that there were at least 12 characteristics of Anskar's missionary thoughts and actions that are important for us to know. So number one, prepare for suffering. Anskar experienced this in many ways. He stated that he actually received a vision that he would be a martyr. Uh, now, martyrdom never occurred to him, but he was an individual who 
always had this on his mind, and, and he worked in areas that were of great risk to his life. He survived a pirate attack uh, on his ship. Of course, as I mentioned, he survived uh, when Hamburg was, was uh, sacked by the Vikings. Many missionaries that he worked with, that he sent into Scandinavian uh, territories, they actually uh, were killed in the work. Uh, he was an individual who uh, was very much um, one who understood suffering and experienced it personally. Work in pioneer areas. So Anskar placed himself among various people groups who did not follow Christ, living in remote regions. This often required an innovative and thoughtful approach to his work. Follow a team approach. Anskar's journeys involved working with a team. He, he was never seen as a lone ranger. Serve through the local church. Now, related to a team approach was this value that he had of being sent from the church into the field. He, he and his teams, they, they were not rogue groups just doing their own thing without accountability and without ecclesiastical support. Involve political leaders. Much of Anskar's ministry opportunities came as a result of political leaders leveraging their authority to provide open doors for missionary work. Give gifts. So closely related to obtaining the permission of leaders, Anskar supported the practice of gift giving. Um, it may be questioned whether it was a, a gift or a bribe because what we see is that Anskar encouraged his his missionaries that he sent to give presents to leaders who may in turn provide opportunities for missionaries to serve in their locations. Number seven, conduct preaching. Anskar was known as a preacher and gave priority to preaching. His, his preaching ministry was often done in public places. Number eight, build church structures. So after obtaining governmental permission, Anskar had buildings of worship constructed for churches. So these buildings obviously made an incredible statement uh, along the landscape in the community. Provide education. Anskar was very much involved in establishing a library. He was involved in educating children, so he established schools in various places as well. Number 10, be self-supporting. Uh, Anskar believed that work among unbelievers should be supported by Christians from other regions and the missionaries' own labors. So the missionaries themselves were not to go to the unbelievers among whom they were working and ask for financial support. Care for others. Anskar worked to serve the poor and also to serve slaves. Uh, he was a man who made sacrifices for those that were in need in the communities where he labored. Uh, Rembert notes that Anskar purchased the freedom of Danish and Slavic boys that uh, were enslaved uh, with his own resources, and then he trained them uh, for ministry. Finally, oppose force. Anskar did not use civil authorities to overcome opposition to his ministry, and he experienced a great deal of opposition, but he never went to those figures that could leverage a strong arm in his favor. Anskar did not leave behind large numbers of Christians. Uh, for example, his work in Sweden produced uh, only a small community of believers, uh, historian Adam of Bremen notes that by the 1070s, Denmark had actually returned to paganism. However, by the 1150s, Norway, Sweden, and Denmark were considered Christianized kingdoms. It would still be 550 years before the Danish Holy Mission would send the first Protestant missionaries to India. But it is safe to say that regardless of the good and troubling processes that resulted in the Christianization of the peoples of Scandinavia, the Lord clearly worked through individuals like Anskar to advance His mission in the world. Hey, thanks for checking out this video. Hey, before you go, leave a comment. What are your thoughts regarding Anskar and the Christianization of Scandinavia? I would like to know. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Hey, as always, don't forget to strike like and don't hide, but subscribe and show you care. Share. See ya.